Anyway, good good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Ian, for that uh, helpful introduction. Um, as Ian said, I'm Bob Heath. I'm the technical marketing manager for iSize, uh, and we have our own cableless system. But I'm actually not going to make this much of an advert. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, cableless systems and and radio communication. So I'm going to go into some maths and physics. Uh, apologies to all the geologists straight away, and um, I want to thank Dr. Sisoam al Hamamsi, whose name I can't even uh, pronounce most of the time, of our uh, SRD systems in Calgary, um, who's, uh, who knows a lot more about these things than I do. Um, let me explain something about these um, logos here. I size this company I work for based in Ponca City, Oklahoma, <laughs> although I'm based in uh, Isha, Surrey, much nicer. Uh, Seismic Source Company is our, is our uh, parent company and SRD Innovations is based in Calgary, Canada and they have 16 fundamental patents relating to high performance Wi-Fi which is very useful for us. Well what does it really take to communicate in, uh, in, in the seismic environment? There have been many bold claims for the benefits of, of uh, cable systems. I've made as many as most um, and the feedback from the field actually can tell a different story. The very places where we'd like to use cableless systems are actually those where communication fails most often. Uh, industry reports are actually uh, showing signs of disappointment in the technology, actually, and uh, especially those for so-called real-time systems. And uh, I'm sorry, John, wherever you've gone to now, but um, this is a generic talk. Uh, I'm not going to talk about shoot blind systems with, which have no communication built into them. If you want to go ahead and shoot blind, well, you know, that's your fault. Uh, increasingly now, users are demanding levels of guaranteed communications in their systems. So what does it actually take in terms of technology to, to make that work? What happens when that fails, as it does? Does your recording system have a fallback mode in that case? So I'm going to review how we got here, because that's actually very instructional. And I'm going to hijack the uh, motto of the Royal Society, nullius in verbo, which basically means don't take my word for it. I'm going to quote papers and things you can go and read for yourself. Why did we want to explore without cables in the first place? So I'm going to get in my bit of cable bashing now. Well, basically, cables are fairly good at this sort of thing, although when there's animals, they get less good at it. Uh, they're less good at this sort of thing, HSC exposure and making messes of the, the planet. They're pretty awful at this sort of thing, cutting swathes of the planet down and having helicopters fly over the place. They're completely rubbish at this. And uh, pretty much anywhere except a desert, you'd, you'd want to use a cableless system. It would have some advantages. Even there, there are places where you don't want to use cables either. Um, the big fight amongst the big manufacturers is uh, amongst cable systems. One says, I can do 30,000. This is, oh, I can do 100. Next says, I can do a million. Well, Good luck to them. Let it fight it out. Most of the world doesn't care about a million channels. Uh, I'm sorry, so so. Uh, in fact, for my money, um, if we're going to talk great big channel counts, I, my money is on the optical in interferometry based systems. I'm grateful to Selixa here for providing uh, this bit of information of some surface data on optical fiber based systems. Well, most of the world then is best done without cables, uh, and therefore we have to deal with the, those sorts of places. So how did we get into this in the first place? Uh, well, the industry was asking basically for lower uh, hardware, which was lower uh, in cost to use, better HSC, uh, better suited to those tough uh, conditions. Land 3D for the same price as uh, Marine 3D, which is what Ian used to go on about. In fact, this is all Ian's fault. Uh, let's get that straight, right straight away. In those days, Ian was less retired than he is now, so he was sticking his fingers all over the place. And he wrote this article and Ian, I brought it with me, just to be sure. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> so, <laughs> I have it scanned in, and I'm going to put it online. Uh, and this was about a system called uh, System 2000. And this was November 1996. And um, this had some input also from AGIP, now called ENI. And as a result of that, some workshops get, got set up. And Ian kicks off by saying this is less of an article, more of a discussion document. Well, actually, it was more like the 11th commandment. It was an edict uh, from on high saying, thou shalt make cableless systems. And many of us thought um, Ian was off his rocker. I included. I took some persuading. Uh, but this was really what Ian was after. And that's why I bought this, just in case you try and deny it here. 
Um, essentially a shoot blind system with some form of communication. So it really wasn't trying to get all the data back in real time. Uh, boxes, one to four channels. It imagined use of VHF communications rather than 2.4 gigahertz. It had options for cable communications between some channels, local collection hubs for uh, harvesting data, and as a result of that, uh, it believed standardization would result. Uh, this was uh, E&I Agip's contribution. Their main thing, really, and their papers here, too, was they really didn't want shoot blind. They wanted some QC back. And Ian, you referred to this paper a minute ago, and this gentleman may be interested. This is the E&I paper, uh, SEG 2012, comparing uh, cable and cableless systems. Uh, I think the cable system was Circle 428, Unite cableless system. And they, set, they actually came up with about a 50% uh, productivity increase by going cableless. What they didn't like was that uh, essentially this was a shoot blind system. And what they actually said was real-time ambient noise monitoring would be nice. And uh, if we had that, then the market for these systems would be better. Uh, I and many others, I must say in all fairness to you, we, we, we thought some of these ideas were a bit made up on the spot, tossed a coin, you know, let, let's wind up the industry like that. Now, I have to say, because I'm always winding up here, uh, now, in retrospect, they look like actual exceptional foresight, um, but, and we're going to get into why that is. Anyway, what technology would, all, what would make this possible? Um, of less foresight, uh, we wanted to uh, distribute the gain curve around the spread. Uh, that's really not very possible um, and not really, nece really nece necessary if we're going to go to 32-bit converters. But most importantly, actually, it paid no attention whatsoever to the commercial reality, what makes people design systems, and then what makes people buy them. Uh, by the way, this might take more than 30 minutes, so you might have to gracefully exit me as well. Uh, it didn't see the role of GPS-based timing and all the problems that would have. It overstated, if I may say so, the relationship between weight per channel and productivity. Uh, indeed, the E&I paper uh, concludes that cable-less channels tend to be more heavy. Um, and uh, it didn't really go on so much about the convenience and flexibility so much of doing away with cables. So how did the manufacturers respond? Pretty much like that. I was one of those manufacturers in those times. Uh, Ian's name was rubbish in um, several places, in fact. Uh, and the response of the manufacturers was, was really, well, we'll make the cables lighter. If that's going to keep happy, that's what they did. And as a result, things got worse. Just about every crew has a great big pile now of cables waiting to be, to be fixed. The real issue with cables is their serial complexity. Um, in other words, if you want uh, all these data, all these channels to come in, everything has to work in just the right way. One little problem can upset your whole day. And this was actually solved by a small company in Canada, as Dave Bamford always tells us, the, the innovations come from the small companies, which was a multi-path telemetry approach. All the big guys copied this afterward and claimed they invented it, but it actually came out of GUX systems in Canada. So this actually was a way of, of, of going forward. Uh, for the mathematicians amongst you, this is the equation which describes serial complexity or serial <coughs> dependency. If you have a string of things, then they all have to work for it to work as a whole. The, the, it's, uh, it becomes very dependent on the number of things. Um, so that's why we didn't want those in cable systems. And with the multipath telemetry approach, you could have multiple paths. So if you had a cut, you could go on working. And the great idea about this is that it's a fallback mode. If things go wrong, you could go on working. And that's actually a pretty uh, important thing in land seismic. It was also Duex Systems, and I'm plugging them because I used to work for them, but they don't exist anymore, uh, who came up with something called remote hybrid telemetry in about 1998, which was a step towards cableless systems because what you actually did is you imagined in, uh, in advance that things would go wrong, and you put in these little boxes around the spread, which had local storage, local power, local timing. Uh, you could, they were connected by radio to the central system. So if things went wrong, you carried on working. Um, this was really the world's first automated intelligent networking, if all goes wrong, approach. Uh, and uh, this is at a bit, in a bit more close-up local storage, all that sort of thing. Uh, actually, there are people who are still copying that idea today. Uh, there is the box. Uh, some people say it never existed. I can tell you it did exist. I used to market it. Um, and it was a great idea. It was actually quite, well, it had some problems, but it was a great idea. Remote combined telemetry actually was started by Seismic Source Company. Uh, I work for them now. I didn't work for them in 2001 using Wi-Fi. They used to make, they still make little recording systems. They're connected together by cables. And they said, well, let's 
shove a Wi-Fi in instead. Uh, that was 2001, and they said, well, uh, if you can do it with one recorder, you can do it with lots of recorders. Uh, they found that Wi-Fi is pretty rubbish at long distance, so they put directional antenna in it. Uh, and in, in that way, they said, well, we can do it with 12 channel recorders, we can do it with three, we can do it with one. And therefore, they sort of had the basis of a, uh, of a wireless system. And there it is in 2001, and you'll notice this, well, these awful antenna that we had to use, although, frankly, things haven't advanced very much in some, in some ways. So there were about 14 cableless systems in the end. Um, most of them entirely ignored what Ian want, uh, wanted. Um, and uh, the most, uh, and the oil companies pretty much ignored them because the oil companies, for the most part, didn't change their acquisition contracts so that you could shoot with lots of dead channels if they existed and lots of noisy channels, which after all is what shoot line cable systems might make you do. Uh, both, so now we have shoot line systems, we have systems with communication, people are upset with both of them, the communication systems don't always work, and in fact, even though there's now hundreds of thousands of channels sold, we're seeing more and more disappointment in the market about, about uh, both these types of systems. Uh, at least one contractor has gone out of business in the US uh, with a shoot line system, because uh, the data came back so poor he was, had to reshoot it. Two companies in the US this year uh, will no longer acquire data using shoot line systems. So this looks like it's good news for the John Flavel Smiths and the Bob Heaths of this world, but it's not quite that easy. Um, we actually get lots of calls from people with systems who, which cannot communicate, because they are a system, uh, we will guarantee that. And what they want us to do is put our system side by side there so that they can actually get some communication out of it. And that's a very good thing because now we're making use of lots of stuff instead of thinking you have to rebuy anything. In fact, this is a crew operating. This has our system plus a shoot line cable system plus a cable, a cable system all working together. And it's a sort of idea that remote hybrid telemetry wanted to get at. I think actually what Ian should have talked about in, in, in the uh, 1996 document was a sort of hybrid approach. After all, he was talking about some, using some cables. And I actually do think this is the future of these hybrid systems. I wrote about that in GeoExpro a couple of months ago, if you're bored enough to bother. A useful exercise actually would be to compare all these systems with the uh, System 2000 approach, but we're not going to do that. It would be more useful to compare with all uh, hybrid systems with System 2000. Uh, I'm not going to get you to, all, to read all that. There are so many comparisons you would have to make to know anything about this. Um, so all I'm going to talk about now is what does it actually take to communicate in the first place. And the bad news is no technology exists which can provide everything needed for all the environments we want to work. Um, and why is that? Well, basically, we have to use 2.4 gigahertz, actually 2.4 to 2.48. Uh, we're power limited to 100 milliwatts, 10 milliwatts in some places. The Americans can use one watt. Uh, it's the only internationally accepted completely licensed free band. And why is that? Because when you, when you switch on 2.4 gigahertz, it quickly decays, and so we're not going to interfere with each other. And it is also the frequency of microwave ovens. It's the frequency of microwave ovens because 2.4 gets, gets absorbed very quickly by water molecules. So anywhere there where there's water molecules, this is going to give you trouble. Uh, so you have significant absorption, you have significant interference, that is what, and, and really pretty low power. Uh, so that's what we have to play with. Uh, thank you very much. So here's the first bit of physics. Won't go into great detail. Water molecules are polarized. They get, get caught in any uh, EM field, and they lose energy under a certain second set of circumstances to that field. That's called the E loss. Here is the E loss in the microwave spectrum. At 2.4 gigahertz, it's, it's enough to annoy you. Um, it's enough to heat your dinner as well. Uh, and some people say, well, let's go to 5.6 or 5.8. It's worse there. Uh, and on top of that, um, talking about 5.6 or 5.8, what the Americans have deemed legal, the Europeans have deemed illegal, and vice versa. So there is actually no agreement about that. So given these propagation characteristics of 2.4, it's pretty simple to guarantee communication anywhere where there aren't really water molecules, and everywhere else it isn't. It's, you know, that's the physics. So, um, we want high quality communications. Uh, we're not going to get it out of in, in, in many environments like this. I know John showed you some different slides. I'm going to go into it a bit more detail. There is one exception. You go anywhere cold, great. Uh, ice is almost uh, transparent to microwaves. Uh, 2.4 will go straight through a block of ice. 
So if you're shooting in the Arctic, don't worry, the Antarctic, if, uh, you know, no problems. Um, but as soon as the ice melts, you're in trouble. And that's actually why microwave ovens have defrost modes. So in fact, important characteristics of the communication band we're allowed to use are really awful. Uh, the weather will change it, vegetation change it. It's unpredictable, it's anisotropic. Uh, this is what we have to deal with. You know, cable systems didn't have to worry about that. So anyway, uh, it's easy to go from very good communications to very poor, and um, uh, you know, this, this is what we're supposed to use to make a, a, a system. So we're gonna get a bit more into the detail now. You make a seismic system ha out of having bits which communicate with each other. They can be box-to-box -box or box-to-relayed thing. Um, and uh, we have to match our geophysical model to how that bit of equipment wants to work. And here's a bit of very basic radio stuff. And to all the radio engineers, I know I'm skipping over lots of stuff, but I don't have time. A radio receiver has to get enough energy at the receiver above the noise level for it to be recognized as a bit of information. Uh, and uh, if, you, uh, if you get that, fine, you see that bit of information. When the, uh, when the energy gets absorbed by something, which it does at 2.4 gigahertz, you're not going to recognize it as a, as a bit of information. Um, so what can you do? Well, um, you can try and increase power. Well, that's illegal in most places. Uh, you can uh, increase power by a factor of 10. You'll be going through batteries in no, no time. It'll make almost no difference. Uh, so we can't do that. We can raise the antenna. That's a lot of trouble. So we can actually spend more time sending the same bit of information. Uh, of course, power time time is energy, um, and that works. And uh, so, uh, but of course, that means we've reduced our bandwidth pretty, pretty considerably. Uh, but it does overcome the absorption idea. The ratios that you're getting now of, of uh, good bandwidth to bad bandwidth to, 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 bad ba to poor bandwidth, it can be either 10 to 1 or 10,000 to 1 just with a few bushes in the way. And just to put some figures on this, uh, a 3 dB loss or absorption is going to more or less half your bandwidth. Um, so you could have better antenna. That's going to that's that's going to buy you a bit more bandwidth or range. Um, th that would be nice, but that you know that's more deployment effort. Um, so where do you make the compromise between effort and bandwidth and, and range? Well, fortunately, seismic data comes in two varieties. There's all the geophone data, the the digitized stuff, which is very high bandwidth, you know, 10 to 20 kilobits per second per channel, and there's everything else. Everything else is the QC, the noise the health, the status, the GPS reception battery, which is really very little data whatsoever. Uh, and the ratio of that is also like 1 to 10,000 or 1 to 1,000. So nature kindly indicates to us that perhaps that's a, that's a hint of how we should make something. Perhaps you should have a basic system because it's quite easy to send low bandwidth data in all these awful environments and have as an option uh, if you want to send high bandwidth data. Now, there's been a lot of papers out there. I like the one from Oxford University, and I like Gupta's, because Gupta's goes on about mesh communication. Uh, you'll, you'll get the video of this. Uh, but these are all talking about 2.4 gig in fixed locations. Uh, we don't do fixed locations in seismic. Uh, we don't have professionals deploy the equipment. We just get anybody who's going. And so we get lots of problems. And it's really essential to understand that all these, what these problems are. There's coverage, which is basically will your system work over a big area because you need it to. There's range. That's the box-to-box -box range. Uh, there's ease of deployment. Um, you know, can, you, can, you, can a juggy do it, basically? Uh, there's capacity. Will your system support enough channels? And there's fault tolerance. If it goes wrong, are there fallback, fallback modes? Um, you shouldn't think that 2.4 gigahertz is, is going to be wonderful. Uh, certainly nothing in, like this, your, your friendly home Wi-Fi. Uh, this is how they tend to work. They try to make connection at a high bandwidth. If that doesn't work pretty quickly, they reduce bandwidth because that's, they can spend more time sending a bit of data. They ch change modulation scheme. Eventually, they give up, and you don't go, get to go on Facebook anymore. Um, and uh, here is my local, friendly, stately National Trust home, There's a, uh, which I just did this test. There's a four-meter high antenna, um, and there's my iPhone, and I go 100 yards away from it, no trees, no signal. That's how quickly it decays. Seismic systems change things a bit because they don't need high bandwidth to kick off with, so they buy themselves range by reducing bandwidth, and that's how they work. So... That's what we got to play, to, to play with, but that, is that enough for seismic? Well, we went and did some tests ourselves. Oklahoma isn't all flat and boring. 
uh, or most of it is, but there are bits, bits of it that aren't, and that's where our test center is, so we go with our equipment and test equipment and try different antennas and things to prove to ourselves what really works. And here's our chief geophysicist proving to himself um, that uh, you stick an antenna up in the air and you get better reception. Uh, that's because Americans have cable TV and not land TV. You see, that's why they need to know that. So we set up a baseline and a directional antenna like this, uh, nothing in the way, quite high power coming out, out of it, and we get about 1,000 meters connectivity out of that. We put some vegetation in the way. It drops off like a rocket. Um, we try and go through a dry bale of hay. Uh, if it's dry, it goes through. Uh, it rains, it completely stops. If the rain it then froze, it would go through again. Uh, these are the things you should know. Well, it did rain, and it rained on that dead tree, and, uh, but because the tree's got holes in it, the signal went through. So some of the th these things are quite hard to predict. Actually, it went through lumps of metal. We were quite surprised because it only needs a little, little hole to get through. So we went through my boss's ugly great big V8 truck because he has spokes on his wheels. So these are the sorts of things you need to think about. Here, even though we made maximum power, it didn't go anywhere through that at all. Far too many water molecules. The way over this, and this is what we all do, is we try and raise the antenna. Um, this is Sirso, this one is seismic. We put big antenna on it because then, of course, you start getting line of sight. 2.4 gig is crazy line of sight. If you can see the other antenna, you're almost in business. But also, you'll find that the world is very anisotropic in most of the places that we want to work. So if you say to yourself, I'm only going to uh, uh, believe I'm going to get low bandwidth uh, reliably, you can switch antenna and you'll be able to get low bandwidth through quite big uh, levels of vegetation. So in, in, in summary of that bit, and, and I'm going to refer to this in a paper a bit later on, absorption totally screws up uh, your 2.4 gigahertz. Um, most environments are anisotropic to 2.4. Directional antenna obviously work better than omnis. Elevation is obviously much better. Type 2 data, which was this low bandwidth stuff, works much better than type A. And can this be quantified from basic theory is a tiny bit of math. Uh, well, we don't tend to work in, in watts in transmitters. We talk, 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 uh, talk about dBm. Um, so we have some power. That's going to decay according to distance. Most people think of that as the inverse square law. We think of that as the free space path loss. And, uh, but that's not all there is to it. You'll get gain from the uh, various antenna. You'll get re sensitivity in the receiving circuit. So this is what your equation starts to look like. Um, and now we see that the theoretical operational range uh, is the relationship between the free space path loss and all these other good things. So there's not too much we can control about this. Uh, you then have to add something called the fade margin, which is allowing for the rubbish that happens in your environment. Um, that's the fade margin. Uh, for example, in line of sight operations, um, uh, you will get a range reduction of 3 dB uh, for every... every Let's start again. You'll get 3 dB, a 3 dB loss because of uh, fade margin will give you a 40% range drop. But this is the big thing. Uh, you need, because of the absorption spectrum 2.4, even a bush makes a difference. So you really need to go around and add up all the bushes. So we have the sigma loss term, um, and that actually is your big problem. Here is a paper, I think it's the Michelin, Michelin one from uh, Dresden. It's a fixed installation. Uh, this, is, this is autumn, this is uh, spring. You can actually see, just because of one tree, uh, about a 20 dB difference. And remember, 3 dB halves your data rate. So just because of that tree, they had a reduction of about a factor of 50 or 100 in data rate. So most seismic environments, this sigma loss term totally dominates because there are bushes and things in the way. Uh, the magnitude of that loss uh, varies anisotropically. It will vary with the time of day. Dew on the leaves will make a difference to you. Uh, everywhere where you have flat deserts, cold areas, that is almost zero. Everywhere else, it makes all the difference. And here are some real figures. Um, actually, these come from seismic systems we test, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Uh, theoretical range on a particular seismic system is 1.58 clicks. I mean, that's almost a mile. Uh, real life, bunging some fade margins, comes down to 25 meters. Uh, I mean, that's the reality of this stuff. So. Uh, so really, how do we cope with that? Because all the laws of physics are pretty much set against us. Uh, well, there's different configurations. This is called point to multipoint. Um, and basically, what you have is, is a, a tower. And you're trying to communicate with boxes there. And uh, that breaks the first rule of making a, a seismic system, which is that all boxes should be doing exactly the same thing. Um, 
This is a picture from the, uh, from the test Ian referred to um, in the prison yard, and of course you can get better, better, better communication if you start raising boxes up. Uh, pretty soon you still run out of steam because you've got too many things in the way, and that's your sigma loss term. Uh, we nevertheless have a, have a uh, mode that works a bit like that. We only try and do it with low data rate, and then we can go through jungles and things like this. You can follow the paths on the observer. So by trying only to go low bandwidth, it always works. Uh, we also use that approach in all our uh, fixed stuff. This is, uh, this is, I think, the world's largest fixed uh, array. It's for microseismic in the north of the US, 800 square kilometers. I think they're up to several petabytes of data now. But it's all fixed antenna, and you know, that's not really suitable for land seismic. Okay, the next thing is point-to-point, -point, uh, the point-to-point -point approach. This suffers because of the, the serial dependency thing. In fact, it's even worse because the data rate gets bigger as you go along. This end, your sigma loss term, is more important than there. So that's not an ideal way to do things. Nevertheless, we, ha we do that ourselves. We do that with, uh, we, with directional antenna, and that tends to get over this loss that you get. Given all these limitations, uh, what is the least problematic way to do that? Well, Milan Polytechnic have a communications department, and they said, well, what we really need to do is have, is have multiple communication things going on, and then you'll have clusters of channels connected to more clusters of channels. Uh, they will be mesh topology, self-healing, self-routing. This helps overcome the anisot uh, anisotropy, uh, makes it more flexible, and so on and so forth. And, um, and the reason this works is that basically you're dealing with the sigma loss term and the serial reliability. You get, essentially get rid of both of those. And we have an option like that. Lots of people think that mesh, it would just go from box to box to box. In fact, this is real life. You can trace the mesh paths. They're all over the place because to the world, um, a radio path, just because it's line of sight, you know, a line of sight is better than a tree in the way because a 20 dB loss in a tree you'd have to go about 500 meters to get that loss. So real life seismic is meshy and anisotropic, and really that's the way to, uh, to, therefore you should build that into your seismic system. This is what the Italians said. This is an IEEE magazine, uh, April last year, this one is. And so basically uh, that seems to be the way to go. And it's actually the way that we in SRD went as well. So we define clusters of, of, of channels. You impose your uh, geometry above this. Uh, essentially, you can have as many clusters as you like, and therefore, pretty much, you can have an infinite channel count if you wanted to. Uh, the, what you can do in a cluster is defined by, uh, well, a bunch of things. Inside a basic system, you would still have this type B data transmission, and if you want to go further than that, you, there's an Ethernet port here, and you can add functionality onto that. In fact, this is the functionality you can add, the antenna type, the protocol type, according to your problem inside the cluster. So uh, this actually enables us to do all sorts of things. Uh, here's a high production vibrosite crew, and it is going. For, this is actually fit just a couple of weeks ago. This is easier than it looks because it was minus 27, and there's and, and in a direct line of sight, there's almost no absorption loss. Uh, somewhere there, I'm told. I guess it's over there. It, uh, the, the snow here was uh, a, uh, a meter deep. Uh, traces were 400 meters apart. Uh, so you better make sure you can get your antenna <coughs> out above the snow. Um, so Ian spoke about standardization. Uh, no two manufacturers are going to make their products work perfectly together. The way to get standardization is to put standard uh, connection protocols on it. That's what we do. We have an Ethernet port and a, US, uh, a USB port. Once you do that, you can use any communication protocol you like. This is also a 3G, 4G connection. Um, once you've got USB connections on it, you can do the, all sorts of things uh, to that. Actually, this was, using, this was used uh, for some 3C connectivity. Uh, there's internal memory, but you can put external memory on it um, if you want to harvest things that way. And this is all really because of standardization. Ian's original idea was that you would connect things together by cables if you wanted to. Well, we have a cableless system which you can connect together by cables if you want to. Uh, you can also make it work offshore. So I'm almost done. This takes the idea of System 2000's hybrid, side-by-side, -side, fewer cables thing, which was the System 2000 ideal, um, and which Geo actually kicked off uh, into the 21st century, 14 years late, 
because you can mix all these things according to how you want to. So in conclusion, the original ideas of System 2000, uh, 18 years ago, uh, turn out to be strangely close to the mark of what technology allows, allows you to do today. So congratulations to Ian for your foresight after all. Uh, but it is the open architecture hybrid systems which are going to enable us to do these standardization things. And um, the great thing about that for, for us right now is that we go along selling our system in which we can guarantee communication to the systems which can't. Well, you, if you didn't understand any of that, this all got published uh, in a 30-page article for DEW magazine. If insomnia is your problem, go get it. Um, and I would finally like to quote Richard Feynman, because he was a good bloke. Uh, we shouldn't try on full nature for a successful technology. Reality must take precedence over public relations. Uh, if you, before you go and buy a system, figure out how it works. Uh, the people I really want to thank are Professor Michelle Fratouche, uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Calgary University, also happens to be part of SRB. All these people, uh, especially Ollie King at Cambridge University, and obviously Google and Wikipedia. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bob. Gosh, it's a, it's a bit yellow, isn't it? <laughs> It is, honestly, it's the, it's the original. There's your fax number. We didn't have USB ports when I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Excuses. Anyway, uh, thanks, Bob. Very, uh, very challenging paper, and uh, I would do it differently if I wrote it now. <laughs> anyway, a question the or two The world is caught up with you. A here. question or two for Bob. Yes, please. Have you considered the possibility of using a helium balloon with a uh, yes, receiving device. Yes, it comes up quite a lot, actually. And <laughs> surprisingly, uh, uh, it, it comes up. Uh, people have thought about that. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't. You do have to worry about your antenna. A lot of these antennas, which people are saying which are omnidirectional, they're not. They're donut. They go there. They don't go there. So you would have to think about that. Um, but yeah, we thought about that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what the vertical range would be for those kind the of The vertical power range is, if you, it's all about bandwidth. If you're not what I call this type B data, uh, the original spec uh, that E and I and BP both came up with was can we see noise? Uh, you know, do we know what's going on? That such, such that this, this, this crew should continue? Has somebody nicked something? It's that sort of thing. That's incredibly low bandwidth, but that is what is su suited to 2.4 gigahertz. In the multiple of environments, we can all make things work in high bandwidth real time by cutting lines and changing things. But that's a lot of deployment effort, especially if we're going to go to 100,000 channels or a million. Or, you know, they all, all these things support lots and lots of channels. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's the awkward places where you really want to use these things, and therefore 2.4 is absorbed, therefore low bandwidth. And low bandwidth actually has quite long, long range. We will punch through solid jungle uh, hundreds and hundreds of meters with the box that's still on the ground. And so deployment effort is zero. Yeah, if we put big antenna on it, we'll go further, but it's twice the deployment effort. And what about using fiber optics in conventional um, wired seismic collection? I, I'm all for that. Like I said, I think that may be the future more than keeping with, with the pairs of copper cables. Um, obviously, there are the Surcells and other of this world are putting their money still in cable. Um, I think, but if, if, if their marketing is to get the huge channel count, then the fiber optic guys will eventually be there as well. Uh, I, I think these pairs of twisted copper cables are sort of like an old wart. You know, we've had it for a long time. We'd rather it disappeared and we forgot about it. Uh, so I think fiber optic, the, the interfrontal fiber optic approach, will cope with that side. And actually, our system works side by side. Those uh, We sell bits to people who make fiber optic systems. I guess the big problem, Bob, isn't it, is the, the very low power that we're allowed to use at 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah, but actually, as I say, it doesn't make any difference because uh, we're allowed to use up to 100 milliwatts. Uh, actually, uh, EIRP, so as radiated everywhere, we can't get gain theoretically. We're not allowed to use get gain, as, uh, so that's 100 milliwatts EIRP. Um, Americans can really do what they want, but actually going from... from 100 milliwatts to, to one watt, which Americans can, is going from 20 dBm to 30 dBm. Well, one tree, well, half a tree will wipe that out. 
And actually, the uh, microwave amplifiers, which they use on those things, are so inefficient that you could put one watt out, it would probably take four times the amount of power <coughs> from the system. You'd be changing batteries all the time. So you'd actually gain nothing. or so little. Use a lot of batteries. A lot of power. It's like having a brighter torch. It isn't going to shine through your hand. You know, it just isn't. The physics is against it. So we have to work within what 2.4 lets us do, which is short range, low bandwidth, unless you want to start doing special things to get through all these environments. Bob is the oracle. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Thanks again, Thank Bob. You. Thank you. <laughs>